wonderful talk. Thank Next you. up is Ajay Gopinathan from UC Merced. Hey, and... Thanks, mom. And I will share my screen. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Yeah. Thanks very much for the invitation, Mo, and also thanks to all four of you for putting together such a wonderful series of talks. That's a truly outstanding job. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about frustrated flocks of cancer cells. Uh, but just by way of introduction, we are a group that does theory and computation on a variety of topics and broadly around biological transport. We look at things across scales from the molecules, looking at things like transport through the nuclear pore complex, uh, we look at uh, transport at the cellular scale by uh, motor-driven transport on cytoskeletal networks. And finally, at the much larger scale, we look at multicellular systems. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So collective motion. So this is something that we are all kind of intuitively familiar with. And uh, roughly speaking, this is something, a phenomenon where you have a large number of individuals that are motile. Uh, which have only access to local, purely local information, but nevertheless, they come together to form these kind of global coordinated cohesive motion. And it's very interesting to us from multiple perspectives. One is that they are typically functional in nature. And so for the case of like these starling flocks or fish schools, uh, they offer pr protection from predators. Uh, it could be in other systems like flocks of geese or clumps of ants, they have mechanical load sharing and perhaps even thermoregulation as in our, one of our favorite examples which is penguin colonies, or even as we heard last week from Oral Peleg, you could have it in uh, collections of bees and hives. And uh, from a physicist's perspective, it's also interesting that these, these kinds of phenomena occur across scales. So starting from something on the micron scale where you have uh, actin filaments that are being powered by molecular motors across the last slide, all the way up to uh, meter scale humans that are kind of being powered by heavy metal and uh, alcohol, presumably, uh, to do these kinds of interesting motions. So it seems that there's this point, some sort of universality that we can look at from these systems. Uh, it turns out that cells in our bodies are also you know, capable of exploiting collective motion. And there's a, uh, I'm having trouble too with the, let me stop sharing. And stop sharing again. Yeah, so, and there's a large number of physiological processes that uh, involve collective cell migration. This includes you know, wound healing, uh, tissue development in embryos, and even uh, cancer metastasis. Uh, so this is a very rich and exciting field and there's a lot of interest in this field. And I just put together a bunch of uh, my favorite reviews on the topic. And if you would like to look for them, the first three are kind of biological in nature and the last two are more, to you more of a physics perspective. Okay, so today's talk is going to be mostly about migration of in lymphomas. And so it turns out that uh, a lot of the metastases of lymphomas are actually carried out by groups of cells that migrate through the lymphatic system up to the lymph nodes and then spread to distant parts of the body. And it turns out that these small clusters of cells called circulating tumor clusters have about 50 times the metastatic potential of single cells. And so not much is known about the physics of how they actually uh, do this collective migration. And so this is a kind of also a rich field and what I'll tell you about today is kind of the little bits of stuff that, that we have done uh, trying to answer this question. Um, so there's lots of open questions that we we'll get, can get to at the end of this talk. Uh, but most of the talk, the uh, things that I'm going to tell you about uh, is done by a fantastic graduate student, uh, Katie Copenhagen, uh, who graduated and is now a postdoc uh, with Josh Shavitz at Princeton. Uh, this is work done in collaboration with a fantastic experimental group of George Sita at the University of Milan and the experiments done by his graduate student, Gemma Malatengra. And this is all work done in collaboration with Mirgal as well. All right, so the system that they have is a in vitro system of uh, malignant lymphocytes that are exposed to a chemical gradient of a substance known as CCL19, 
which is a physiological relevant chemoattractant because that is produced in the lymph nodes. Um, and so without further ado, let me just play these movies, which will hopefully play. Okay, now I'm gonna have to, I don't know why. All right. Can you still see? All right. So uh, we're gonna look at these four movies. So the first Ajay, we is, don't see anything. You don't we see can, anything? We, we only see you. We don't see the slides. Wow. You have to share. Yeah, uh, that's right. I was hoping you would see it in my glasses, but that's probably too small. All right. Okay, let's try this again. Now we can see. All right. Let's hope. Okay, the movie plays. All right. So uh, what's happening here? So there's four movies that you can see here. Uh, and in the first movie over here, these are the cells that are placed in no chemoattractant gradient. So there's no CCL19. And you can see that you, they still form these clusters, and, but there's no net migration. So you can see single cells moving around and the clusters forming and nothing moving around. As you move to the right, uh, this is slightly higher gradient. And what you'll see here is now that the single cells are not very responsive, but you can see that the clusters that form seem to have a sense of the gradient are actually migrating up the gradient. If I ramp up the uh, gradient some more, so now we're going to 100 nanogram per mil at the other end, and you can see that these clusters are really directionally migrating, and the single cells also seem to have that. Uh, but the most interesting thing here is this last movie on the right, and I'll let it play for a second if you can see what's so dramatically different. So this is the highest chemoattractant gradient. And what you might notice is that the clusters are still unaffected. They're still migrating up the gradient, but the single cells are actually turned around and going the other way. So they are actually doing chemo repulsion. And so this is a known thing that happens with these lymphocytes is that when they are expressed to high concentrations of these uh, CCL19, uh, they actually, there's some downstream signaling, they actually flip their polarity and they undergo chemo repulsion. And at these concentrations, these are the kinds of concentrations that are present in our lymph nodes. And it's actually physiologically important to get mature lymphocytes out of the lymph nodes, okay? So, so that's the uh, physiological function. But what is interesting here is these malignant single cells follow chemorepulsion, but these clusters don't. They still migrate up the gradient. And this is one of the causes that they can get up into your lymph nodes and then spread to distant parts. And so this is uh, thought to be one of the leading causes for why they are so, you know, their metastatic potential is so high. Okay, so all the work that I'm going to describe has been done here and published here, and you can look for a review here as well. All right. Okay, I have to do something different now. Fine. This is very, never had this issue before. Maybe I'll try just uh, sharing the presentation. Can you see it now? Yes. All right. So you oh. All right. Okay, so the question now becomes what actually drives the rotation? So what, what we can actually look at the phases of these individual clusters to see what's going on and to see uh, what can be the cause for this kind of intrinsic behavior. So what we did is we looked at each of these uh, cell clusters. And so what you see on the left is going to be a movie, if it plays, uh, of these cell clusters. And you can see there are these red and blue dots. And these are uh, images of the nuclei 15 seconds apart. And so you can actually assign uh, a kind of a directionality vector, a velocity vector to each uh, cell based on the positions of the nuclei. And what you can do is then look at how these velocity vectors are aligned relative to each other. And if you analyze this for a while, what our collaborators found is that you can roughly think of them as showing three kinds of phases. A running phase where all the velocity vectors are aligned, there's a flock. Uh, you can also see a random phase where there's not much correlation between the individual velocity vectors. And interestingly, you can also see a rotational phase where the thing appears to do some sort of a solid body rotation. And what is interesting is that these clusters show all three phases and they transition between these phases spontaneously. 
So the question then becomes, you know, what drives the rotations of these phases and these spontaneous transitions? And can they, do they have any role in promoting chemotaxis in these malignant cell clusters? And so the speculation from the biology perspective is the following. So let me walk you through this. So that in a shallow gradient, if you take a single cell, uh, the single cell has difficulty perceiving a shallow gradient. There's a lot of noise. And so its directionality is not that great. If you put it in a cluster, you can imagine that the noises will cancel out. And so you get this kind of collective sensing and you can move in the right direction, which is what you saw, which is great. Uh, well, what happens in a steep gradient? Well, the single cells, as I told you before, are subject to chemo uh, repulsion because they have overloaded their receptors and they turn around and run away. But the, the clusters have no trouble following that same gradient. And so how does the cluster avoid this chemo repulsion at the individual cell level? And so the idea is something like this, which is that you have these other phases, this rotating phase and this kind of random phase. And so in this rotating phase, you can imagine a situation where the leading cells of the cluster, which take up most of the load of sensing, uh, actually keep getting replaced by other cells. So you can think of this kind of like a flock of keys in some sense, uh, they're load sharing. And the other speculation is that exchanges between the exterior and the interior can lead to leader cells being replaced as well. And so they are again protected from going into chemo repulsion. So anyway, that's the speculation. And so we decided, okay, we should make a model first to see whether we can produce these kinds of interesting phases from simple physical mechanical interactions between the cells. And two, whether it is at all plausible for these kinds of mechanisms to actually enable robust chemotaxis of these clusters. Okay, so our simple model is the following. Each cell is an agent. Uh, it has its own propulsion in a certain direction, and that direction is this n vector. And this direction, or the polarization direction, uh, is set by its uh, own movement, as well as a sort of alignment interaction with the uh, uh, velocity directions of its neighbors. Okay, and so this is also known to happen where cells tend to align their polarizations, especially in tissues, and so this is essentially a way of modeling that interaction. Uh, the velocity of these uh, cells are set by physical forces. So each cell has propelled uh, <clears throat> in the direction of its polarization and it's subject to physical forces here. This is simply excluded volume and cohesion, which we model by the sort of Leonard Jones potential. And it turns out it's not really important what that potential is because we've done it with springs and other things as well. And then there's noise. And then you simply update the positions of each of these guys and see what happens. Uh, sadly, nothing interesting happens. So if you do this, what you'll get are clumps of cells. Uh, if the propulsion is high and the noise is low, you get this kind of flocking behavior. And if the propulsion is low and the noise is high, you get this random set. And that's all. So you get one or the other, there's no transitions, there's no rotation, so any kind. And so we realized, of course, that there must be something wrong with the system that we are uh, actually not being able to, we're not taking into account some physical phenomenon. And so, yeah, uh, we decided to look at what that could be. And we went back to the experiments and we found that the answer was, oh my God, this is insane. All right. Let's see if I can do this another way. All right, I will skip to that slide. All right, and so what we did, we, what we found is that there's contact inhibition of locomotion present in the system. So that is cells uh, that have a large number of neighbors are going to turn down that propulsion, whereas cells that are at the rim or the exterior actually have a higher value of the propulsion. And this has been known for like more than 50 years. And this is a physiological process that is important in epithelial to mesenchymal transitions and so forth. Uh, and so what we decided to do was to actually put this into our model. So we actually let the propulsion of each cell depend on the number of neighbors it has in a linear fashion. So as the number of neighbors increases, the propulsion decreases linearly. And if we were to put that into the model, uh, what we get is something that looks fairly cluster-like. Uh, it actually shows the three phases that we are talking about. 
Uh, it's kind of a fluid cluster. It will show rotations and translations and also regions where you get some. And I have better movies which I can show if time permits. But for now, let me say that this is what the movies look like. Uh, and then what we can do is to compare it to experiment is to do the same kinds of measurements for both the simulations and the experiments. And so what we do is we measure the net polarization of the group, which will be high if it's in a flocking mode or a running mode. And we measure the angular velocity of this clump as well, and which is going to be high if it's in a rotating mode. And then with these metrics, we can actually partition it into different kinds of phases. And what we see is that if you tune the parameters right, then you can in fact get your simulations and experiments to match very well the proportion of time that these clusters spend in the running, rotating, and random phases. Right, so what I've shown you now is that if you, the key ingredient here is the heterogeneity in the cluster, that is having cells uh, display propor proportion that depends on what the, the neighbor number or local density is. So cells on the rim behave differently from cells in the interior. And that is all that is required to produce these phases and transitions. But is there some way to kind of understand why this happens? And so to do this, we did this kind of theory Gedanken experiment. So you think about the cluster, the cluster, you can think of a system with two subparts. There's an interior core, which has a lower propulsion and an exterior rim, which has a higher propulsion. So we just simply cut the system into two pieces, just the rim and just the core, both of which have a uniform propulsion. There's no heterogeneity. So we have two uniform systems and we simulate both of them. And I already told you what will happen if you just have a cluster that looks like this. Uh, so what you're going to do is actually look at the proportion of running, rotating, and random phase as a function of the noise and the propulsion. So for this green core cluster, what you'll see is that for high propulsion and low noise over here, you have mostly a running phase. And as you increase the noise beyond a certain critical value of the noise, you switch to a random phase and there's no rotating phase in between. And this you get either one or the other. We do the same thing for this rim as well. So we change the proportion of the rim and the noise and watch what happens. And you get a very similar transition. That's this orange line here. It's just that you get, again, you get a running phase or a random phase. Now no rotating phase. And the critical transition line is a little bit lower because it's a little harder to stabilize the running phase because these guys have fewer neighbors. But you don't get rotations or anything interesting. So, but if you couple these two systems together, so you have two uniform systems, uh, and you couple them together. And we do that by fixing the proportion of the rim to be some fixed value, high value eight. And then we take the core, put it inside and run the system for various values of the core propulsion and noise. And lo and behold, you now get a very different phase space. The coupled system actually has a region here where you actually have rotating. And not only do you have a rotating phase, you have running phase and a random phase. So there are actually transitions between these phases. And it, the full model uh, phase space looks pretty similar. So can we understand why this is happening? So to do that, uh, what we look at is this critical noise value that I was talking about on the previous slide. And so for the rim, which has a fixed propulsion, which we set to eight in some arbitrary unit, it has a fixed value of the critical noise up here. And so that's what I'm calling the rim transition. And for noise values below that, the rim would like to be in its ordered state, that is in a translating flocking state. For the core, you can do the same analysis and you get this slanty line because as you change the core propulsion, you know, the noise value changes. And so now what you have is this interesting triangular region, which is above the line for the core and below the line for the rim. And so in this region, the rim wants to be in its ordered state. The core wants to be in its disordered state, okay? and its random state. The core, the rim wants to be in its running phase. The core wants to be in its random phase. And so now you have uh, a frustration in the system, which is due to the coupling of a disordered core and an ordered rim. And of course, uh, I'd like to stop again to allow me to advance my slide. Uh, yeah, so I'll, Ajay, you can take an extra few minutes since you're being- That's okay. I don't know why this is happening. It didn't happen in the tests. We did so many tests. It was happening uh, to me too. And I found that if, if you click on the mouse, it will advance the slides. Okay, good to know. Let me try that. Uh, all right. There you go. Good to know. 
All right, so what happens here, okay, so you put these two things together, this is what happens, and there's a frustration in the system, and this frustration can actually be relieved by the rim rotating. And so as the whole cluster rotates, the rim now has some sort of alignment with its neighbors, and so it is sort of in its uh, running state, if you will, because at least the alignment is preserved, and the core is not translating, so this is a compromise between the disordered core and the ordered rim. Okay, so this is kind of my hand waving explanation for why you would expect to see this. And so that gives us some intuition about it. But the model, you know, you can do more with the model. So what I'm going to do is skip this because it's interesting, but I can come back to it later. It has to do with, you can tell the phase, the collective phase of the cluster simply by looking at defects in the velocity field along the perimeter. And this connects to something else that I'll be talking about later. But I'm going to skip this and then simply jump to talking about implications for cluster chemotaxis. All right, so I mentioned that these, okay, so I, what I've shown you so far is that if you have this heterogeneity, you have uh, <clears throat> a contact inhibition of locomotion added to the system so that the rim behaves different from the core, you can get these three phases and transitions between these phases. And what I told you before was the speculation that these rotations and reshufflings can actually have a beneficial, well, beneficial for the cluster, but not for the person uh, that is experiencing this, uh, beneficial effects for migration of these uh, clusters. And so is there some sort of emergent load sharing? That's the question. So to answer that question, uh, we look at the situation where you put this uh, cluster in a chemical gradient. And so what we do is we add to every cell a force that is dependent on the local chemokine concentration and that is oriented in a direction towards its free surface. And so things on the rim that are exposed have an exposed area will actually point there. Uh, they'll have experienced the force in that direction. So you put this together and you put this into your model and you look at what happens. And so the simulation results are shown here. And it's what it's showing you is the proportion of running, rotating, and random phase as a function of the gradient. Uh, so as you increase the gradient, what you'll notice is that the running phase, which is in red, actually increases, uh, whereas the rotating phase decreases and the random phase remains constant. Now, if you're trying to, and you can see the same kind of trend in the experiments, and we can't actually match them directly because the gradients are arbitrary in, in our simulations, but you can see the same kind of trend where as you increase the gradient, the running phase increases and the rotating phase decreases, uh, and the random phase remains about constant. So in a sense, if you're trying to design something that is trying to follow a gradient, this is actually a good design because what you're doing is as you get more directional input in terms of increased chemoattractive gradient, you stabilize the running phase, which means in a kind of run and tumble sense, you're actually following the gradient, right? And you also decrease the rotation so that you don't reorient yourself unnecessarily. So that seems great, but then you might, say to me, well, wait a minute, but this is actually the opposite of what we wanted because we said that these rotations and random phases are going to help these uh, malignant clusters avoid the schema repulsion of single cells and follow the uh, direction of the gradient robustly at high gradients. And this doesn't seem to be the case because the rotations are falling. And so what we did is we said, okay, can we actually measure the exchange of cells between the rim and the core in these systems. And so that's what we did next. Ah, let me, there you go. And I used the Wallace solution. So there you go. In the next slide, the, if we look at the cluster fluidity, which is simply uh, the number of exchanges between the rim and core per unit time. And we measure this as a function of the gradient in the system, uh, the chemical chemotraction gradient in the system. And what we see is there's an increase in this exchange. As you increase the gradient, there's an increase in this exchange. But how do we understand that? Because what you do when you increase the gradient, as I just said before, is you increase the proportion of running phase. So this cluster begins to run more and more. And so we look closer into the running phase to see what is happening. And it turns out what happens is that the, uh, <clears throat> the cluster ha does something interesting, which is that cells at the, uh, the front actually go into the core, whereas cells at the back pop up. So if you look at the rim, the rim is trying to kind of flow past the disordered core 
All right, and so there, there are two defects in the velocity field on the perimeter, one at the front edge and one at the back edge in the running phase. And what happens is that cells tend to collect to the front edge and pop in and then pop back out at the back edge. And so this gives you a natural mechanism for leader cells that are susceptible to you know, being saturated and turning into chemorepulsion to go into the core of the, of the cluster and replenish themselves and pop out at the back, okay? So this is actually what happens. You can get this kind of thread milling pattern and I can show you movies if you have time. And that thread milling pattern actually helps you uh, avoid this chemorepulsion. So that's- um, Could yeah. you wrap in about- I'm done. This is my summary. All right, so I'm going to, so just in summary, we have what I've shown you is that there's running, rotating, and random phases that are seen in these experiments. And we've managed to reproduce them with only short range interactions by introducing heterogeneity in the form of contact inhibition of locomotions. Uh, rotations that I showed actually result from the coupling of an ordered rim that is trying to translate and a disordered core that's trying to be in its random phase. Uh, I did not talk about this, but the interactions between the topological defects in the velocity field that I just mentioned, you can measure kind of a pair correlation function for these uh, defects and show that they are actually correlated with the phase. And so from our simulations, we can predict the phase and we can actually measure these pair correlations in the experiment and show that they match what we predict. So which is actually interesting and probably has applications to other systems as well. And there's something that are things we don't understand here. And we showed that increased running phase with an increased chemokine gradient implies increased fluidity and increased interior periphery exchanges. And so uh, to sum up, what we've shown is that there's this increased foraging efficiency by this collective run and tumble of the cluster. And there's also increased load sharing, allowing these clusters to overcome the chemorepulsion and migrate up into the lymph nodes in the presence of high chemotactic gradients. So with that, I will stop and uh, thank everybody who was involved. And as I mentioned before, Katie Copenhagen, who's now with Josh's group at Princeton, uh, Giorgio and Nir, uh, and thanks to all the funding agencies and the thanks to our center, the Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Machines. Uh, and I'll just put out a plug that we are looking for postdocs and it's essentially a position where you could be a project scientist at the center working with about 30 people from physics, bioengineering, chemistry, clinical biology, and so on. So I'll put that out there and with that, stop. All right, All right. questions. Yeah, thanks Ajay for a wonderful talk. So I'm going to ask a selection of questions from the chat box and we can take more in, in the 15 minute time. So the first question I want to ask is from Vipasa Ade and she's asking, uh, CCL19, higher concentration, seems to have larger clusters. Any correlation? And also, how big a cluster needs to be to sense the gradient? Oh, both super excellent questions. So it turns out that uh, you need a cluster of about 20. And this is, uh, you know, known, I mean, shown from experiments as well, that the cluster, there's a minimum cluster size that has about 20 cells in order to actually uh, sense the gradient, and that's also what's actually seen physiologically that the circulating tumor clusters have to be about 20 cells or so in order to metastasize. Uh, the size dependence, which I totally glossed over, and I you can look at the paper and I can walk you through it. Um, but uh, the something that we are exploring right now, which I glossed over as well in this talk is the fact that we were actually looking at a single cluster and we were not allowing addition of cells to the cluster or uh, you know, the break in the clusters. And that's something we are exploring right now. And that's an important part of the uh, puzzle is, is there a correlation between the gradient and the size of the clusters? And there is, as you can probably tell from the movies, as you increase the gradient, you actually get bigger clusters. And so that's something we are looking into right now. And so basically open question at this point. So. Okay, uh, Sriram Ramaswamy asks, do the cells within a cluster move around a lot uh, or more or less keep the same neighbors? Yeah, so that's an excellent question as well. We worried about this for a while. And it turns out <clears throat> to a large extent, they keep their neighbors. There is some fluidity on the order of, I mean, of, of the entire simulation. So if you run the, look at the cluster for time scales, of the experiment, which is about, it can be up to hundreds of minutes. 
uh, you will see exchanges in millibursts. But uh, on shorter time scales that I've been looking at, like tens of minutes, you don't see too much rearrangement. But you do see exchanges from the periphery to the interior. So, but once in the interior, there is still a migration because there is this kind of treadmilling behavior going on. But modulo that, there is not too much fluidity within. Them. So it's not like a completely liquid droplet to be. And uh, then uh, Rudra Biswas asks, why does overloading chemo uh, receptors lead to single cells turning around? Wouldn't they ah. just do an isotropic random walk? That's an excellent question. This is a very biology question. So all I can say is that what they do is they, there is some magic downstream signaling pathway where they switch their polarity. So these cells, as I mentioned before, the way they move is they adhere to the surface, put out protrusions, adhere to the surface and pull themselves forward. So this direction, this polarization, front to back polarization is important for their motility. When their receptors get over uh, uh, saturated, uh, what happens is that they flip this polarity. So the front back, the back becomes the front and the front becomes the back and then they go in the opposite direction. So that is what happens. If you are, I don't know if that completely, that probably doesn't completely answer your question. So because the nature of the downstream signaling is something that you know, is a matter of uh, still active research and people are trying to understand that. But that's the physics -y explanation. So I will ask one more question, then we will go to the overflow questions for 15 minutes, right? Okay. So the next, the last question I want to ask you in this thing is uh, from Raul Bondash. He is asking, sorry if I mis mispronounced your name. Uh, uh, do the topological defects and the treadmilling appear because the real system is 3D and your model is 2D? Ah, so by real, I guess I guess I have to push back on real. So the in the in vitro system is effectively 2D. We have done 3D. We've done 3D confocal stacks. We have looked at the 3D positions and the 3D velocity vector. Of the, but the, essentially it forms kind of a monolayer. So there's not much information in the third dimension in vitro. <clears throat> in vivo, this is a completely different situation as you might well imagine. And you could have 3D clusters. Um, and uh, it's even qualitatively different because in a 3D cluster, the core has no contact with the outside. Whereas here, all our cells are contacting the substrate and are capable of exerting protrusive forces. So I would anticipate in the 3D clusters, you know, these kinds of effects will be exacerbated. Uh, so that's kind of the connection. But in the in vitro system, is a 2D system. So. Okay, I guess I will ask one final question before we move because I kind of like this question using my discretion as moderator. So from Anton Suslov, two related questions. How important is the cluster? How important is that the cluster core is disordered? Does the core ever have hexatic or crystalline order? And second part of his question, if you confine the clusters, do you get rotation even for homogeneous activity? That is both the second, I'll just take the second part first. It is true, yeah, if you do confine a cluster, you will get rotations even with homogeneous activity has been shown uh, quite extensively and we can see it as well. Uh, so, and the first part of the question was, do you see hexatic order? Is mm -hmm. that the- okay. Hexatic or crystalline inside, yeah. Yeah, so in the cell system, this is something we've been looking at. Uh, we do, I mean, okay. So we do not see that order. However, this, you have to remember that these cells are, uh, squishy, uh, they change, their shapes change quite a bit, even in the core. Um, so that could be the reason that we don't see kind of order. And in our simulations, we actually have, and you can probably see it much more clearly here, we actually have a system where we, there's a Gaussian spread of sizes to prevent this crystallization. If you allow crystallization to happen, there are some interesting effects that pop up. Uh, that are we mentioned in the supplementary work and we are, which is quite interesting, but probably unphysical and unrelated to this system, but could be useful in other systems. 